Veteran on the Move, number 29. Welcome to Veteran on the Move, your pathfinder to freedom. If you're a transitioning veteran, an entrepreneur wannabe, or someone who's still stuck in that J-O-B trying to escape, this podcast is dedicated to your success. So welcome aboard, sit back, and enjoy the ride. Army veteran John Lee Dumas is the founder and host of Entrepreneur on Fire, a top-ranked podcast named Best in iTunes for 2013. John interviews today's most inspiring and successful entrepreneurs seven days a week and has been featured in both Time and Inc. Magazine and is the founder of Podcasters Paradise, a community where podcasters can create, grow, and monetize their podcast. Entrepreneur on Fire generates over 550,000 unique downloads a month with past guests such as Seth Godin, Tim Ferriss, Barbara Cochran, Gary Vaynerchuk, and Guy Kawasaki. John, thanks for being here today. Let's start with telling us a little bit about what you did in the Army. Well, Joe, I was an armor officer in the U.S. Army for a total of two years, followed by uh, my last two years as a logistics officer. So I definitely had quite the number of jobs while I was in the military, but again, starting off as an armored platoon leader in charge of four tanks and 16 men based out of Fort Riley, Kansas with the 1st Infantry Division where we did deploy to Iraq for a 13-month tour of duty from uh, September 03 to October 2004. Yeah, the 1st Infantry Division, the Big Red One, right? Big red one got the combat patch on my right shoulder. Yeah, just uh, actually just down the road from where I'm at now here in Kansas. So, oh, cool. Yeah, we had a conversation at one point. You and I were in Iraq at the same time, very close to each other. I was at uh, TQ, the Alta Cotton Airfield, and you were right near there, weren't you? Literally across the bridge. So at the time when yeah. I was there, it was called Camp Manhattan, but that's because being stationed at Fort Riley, Kansas, uh, we had the town called Manhattan, Kansas, oh, right next yeah. to us. So that's why we named that town, I mean, that little fort, uh, Camp Manhattan. But of course, every uh, different set of, of soldiers that's um, occupied it after us n- changed the name. But yeah, TQ was right across the bridge. I actually had to go there probably four or five times a week. Um, just uh, for different supplies and different things that we needed to get because that was one of the main areas in the location for us. Yeah, and that's uh, all all the activity that was going on at the time. It was very busy uh, back there in 2004. It's probably a good good talk for another time, huh? Yeah, for sure. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about what your transition, what the end of your army, getting out of the army and what your transition was like. Yeah. So, you know, after my 13 month tour of duty, I got back to Fort Riley, Kansas, and I actually did transition into that logistics field because I um, had that kind of half and half that a lot of my classmates got when we were commissioned as officers back in 2002. So I kind of became the uh, Fort Riley logistics officer. I was in charge of helping uh, both soldiers deploy and redeploy uh, from Fort Riley. So I got to see a lot of interesting things there. And my last year and a half in the Army, um, which was that time after getting back from Iraq, went by pretty quickly um, doing just that. And then there I was, 26 years old, a civilian for really the first time in my life. Because, you know, I mean, I was kind of always under somebody's thumb, you know, from years zero to 18, you're under your parents' thumb. And then from 18 to 24, I was already, or sorry, 18 to 22, I was already under the Army's thumb as a cadet at Providence College. And then from 22 to 26, obviously, I was in the Army. So I was kind of this civilian, this free civilian for the first time with no debts, with a decent savings account and a passion for life. So that's a pretty interesting combination, Joe. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Going back while you're a little in the army, was there ever any, uh, did you ever have any kind of an entrepreneurial itch while you were still in the army before you got out? Not really. I actually never even felt an entrepreneurial itch until about the age of 32. So I think that's a pretty uh, good feeling and thought for a lot of the listeners that maybe are in the same boat because, you know, we hear a lot of stories 
from people like Gary Vaynerchuk or Mark Cuban or, you know, whoever it might be that, you know, they were growing up selling baseball cards on the weekend for thousands of dollars and, you know, running around, like doing all these crazy things as kids, selling lemonade and whatever it is that people do when they're entrepreneurs as kids. And that just wasn't me. It wasn't me as a kid. It wasn't me in college. It wasn't me in the army. And it wasn't me for the first six years post-military either. I really was kind of that person that's for, again, the first 18 years of my life was doing as little as possible to kind of get by, um, focusing more on sports and fun. And um, then when I became a civilian post-military, I was like, okay, like what's the next step now on that career path, which led me to some pretty interesting careers. Now, I mentioned uh, in the intro already that you are, are definitely one of the big podcasters of today. So I was curious, how did you actually discover podcasting and then arrive in the podcasting world yourself? So that is an interesting story because I did not come into the understanding or knowledge of podcasting for quite some time. It was actually a solid four years um, went by of podcast being around before I even caught wind that they existed. And for me, it was actually during my time um, trying real estate, both in commercial and residential, just trying to figure things out in life. And I'd already failed at a number of previous careers. And so now I was in real estate, taking another swing of the bat. And with real estate, which I'm sure a lot of listeners can know and appreciate, you spend a lot of time in a car. So I quickly got very tired of radio, of talk radio, of sports radio, you name it. Like I was over it. And audiobooks were great, but they were really expensive when you who are spending four or five hours a day in a car going through book tapes left and right. So I was looking for a better way to consume inspirational, motivational content while I was driving. And luckily, a friend of mine put me onto iTunes and I started listening to podcasts, these free, on-demand, targeted content that was in so many different niches and so many different styles and so many different opportunities that I said, wow, this is something that I get. It just clicks with me why podcasting works. I love it. And I became a rabid consumer of podcasts for about three years, um, just being a consumer, you know, before I ever even considered jumping on the other side of the microphone. You know, listening to to how you discovered podcasts and how you got in, I had almost the exact same experience. Oh, cool. And, you know, I got so into my podcasts and stuff that I almost look forward on my, look forward to my drive to and from work because I knew that's when <laughs> I was going to be able to listen to my podcast. So, so how did you take it from there and actually end up starting a business uh, in the podcasting world? So, you know, there's the thing that you hear a lot of entrepreneurs um, successfully do that I was also able to do they were able to find this need, this void, this itch that needed scratching out there in the marketplace. And for me, that that need that was requiring filling was the fact that there wasn't enough podcasts out there that were really interviewing the type of people that I wanted to hear from, that were really breaking down successful and inspiring entrepreneurs' journeys and really kind of dissecting those and pulling out the key points and the successes and the failures and the aha moments. There were some great ones that were out there, but they were coming out once a week, twice a month. And I was going through people's back catalog like a madman. And somebody that had a podcast going for two years. I found their podcast and I ripped through all of their podcasts in just three weeks because they only had about 50 of them because they were interviewing people every other week. So there was two years of content gone and I just couldn't imagine having to wait around for just one 30 minute interview every two weeks. And I said, there has to be a seven day a week podcast so I can wake up in the morning and know that there's an interview waiting for me. So I ran to iTunes, I did all the research and nothing even close to that existed. And I said, wow, there is a massive void in this marketplace. And like the great Gandhi says, be the change that you want to see in this world. And instead of just complaining about it, which a lot of civilians would do, I decided to be a military veteran and stand up and take some action. And I decided to be that change that I wanted to see. And I invested in myself, hired a mentor, joined a mastermind. And two and a half months after that aha moment of creating that daily podcast, 
Entrepreneur on Fire went live in September of 2012. And Joe, here we are, 700 episodes later, having won Best of iTunes in 2013. And that idea that I put into action has now turned into a business that in 2014 alone will generate over $2.5 million in revenue. I'm so jealous. <laughs> you know, that's crazy, over 700 episodes. And uh, tell us, you know, in the beginning when you started socializing this idea around of a daily podcast, some of the experts in the business actually said you were crazy, right? Well, let's even go further than that because you're completely right. But my mentor, who was one of the most successful podcasters in her own right, Jamie Tardy, the eventual millionaire, and the podcast answer man himself, Cliff Ravenscraft, who was the founder of my mastermind, Podcast Masterminds, that I was investing $300 a month with, people that I looked up to more than anybody else in the industry were saying, John, I love your passion. I love your direction. You're going to be a success, but slow down, buddy. Don't do a a seven-day-a-week show. You're going to burn out. You're never going to find enough guests. You're going to burn your listeners out. Just kind of come back to the crowd here. You know, we're all zigging right now. Don't you zag. Do a weekly podcast. Come out with this consistent content on a weekly basis, and uh, you'll do just fine. And I said, wow, if the top people in this industry are telling me that it can't and shouldn't be done, that that excites me because that even shows me that there is a great opportunity for that person that does figure it out, that does have the discipline and creates the structure to have a seven day a week podcast. So that just propelled me forward, Joe. I put my blinders on in that area because to be fair, they gave me an incredible amount of value and help in building all of my podcasting business. But in that one area, I was not going to move. I was stuck on my seven day a week format and I haven't missed a day. And that's great that you took their doubts and actually turned them around. And instead of discouraging you, it actually encouraged you and challenged you and you went and did it anyways. And I'm, of course, I'm thinking now of the Toby Key song, How Do You Like Me Now? <laughs> you would, Joe. You're into that stuff. I love it. Now, have they, have they ever admitted to you, okay, I guess you're right. Well, yeah, in so many ways, you know, they're, they're pretty prideful and rightfully so, because they're very successful uh, in their own right. But, um, you know, they definitely have, have given me the head nod. <laughs> well, probably not everybody out there could have pulled off what you pulled off. So, um, yeah. And, 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 you know, it's really interesting you say that too, because now, you know, you'll, you'll listen to different things and, you know, Cliff has come out and said this publicly a few times. He's like, you know, now in my podcasting A to Z course, like, Everybody comes to me and they say, okay, Cliff, teach me how to do a seven day a week podcast that interviews inspiring and successful entrepreneurs. And Cliff's like, whoa, like just because John was able to do it doesn't mean you can. Cause you know, there are specific reasons why John was successful and there's specific reasons why you might not be. But you know, for the listener, you know, what you really need to look at and what I'm seeing out there in this world is, you know, just be authentic to yourself. I mean, Joe, you're being authentic with your mission, with your podcast, and it resonates incredibly well with the listeners. And for anybody that wants to go out there and and be authentic with their mission, with their business, if that might be a podcast, that's great as well. You know, really look inside and say, you know, what resonates with me? How am I going to be able to shine in my own right? And then drive forward in that direction. I mean, you know, and in any business, but even like writing a book, but, but especially podcasting, that's what I love about the niche podcast is you really truly can be yourself and niche down to what you want to do and then build an audience. And and that's totally. essentially what you did. And so talking about building your audience, you actually, your audience actually grew quite large and actually quite rapidly. And, uh, and what's interesting about that is at first, you, you thought you were going to monetize it in a certain way, or you weren't even really sure how you're going to monetize your podcast. But what you, what ended up happening was your audience told you what they wanted. And, exactly. And, and that's, that's how you ended I, up doing it, right? And that's what I find really interesting about a lot of people that start today. And I, I was in the exact same boat. I mean, a lot of people's first question is, you know, how am I going to turn this into a viable business? How am I going to monetize? And I was getting the same questions myself when I was launching a seven day a week podcast. People were asking me how how I was going to monetize, and I didn't have the answer because I didn't know. But what I did know was that if I provided enough value consistently and for free, that I would be able to build an audience that, just like you mentioned, Joe, would tell me 
how to monetize. They would show me the light. And maybe sometimes there's a little prodding you can do. And that little prodding, Joe, is just a very powerful question. What are you struggling with? And then just listen. And the responses will absolutely blow you away as the actual host, as the tribe leader, you know, as that person that has that audience. And then you can listen to their struggles or pain points or obstacles and challenges, creates a solution for that in the form of products, services, communities, coaching, whatever that might be, and really drive forward in a very monetization and financial focused way. And one of the one of the first things, and actually one of the biggest things, at least up until recently, was you decided to start Podcasters Paradise, right? Yeah, Podcasters Paradise is actually about to celebrate its one year anniversary, which is right. crazy that you know we've already been rock and rolling for a year, but you know we just crossed our we just well, we just welcomed in our fourteenth fourteen hundredth member into Podcasters Paradise, which pushed us over. $1.2 million in revenue for Podcasters Paradise alone in the 11th month, in the 11 months since we opened the door. And it's just been an incredible success to see the community coming together, to see Podcast Paradise hangouts all over the country and even world. And of course, when we actually get together at conferences and we just got together at the podcast movements in Dallas, Texas last month, you know, we had 125 paradisers come to that conference and we all got together and just had a blast. So it's an incredible community. We have a lot of fun together. And, you know, overall, it's just cool to know what you can do as a as a host, as a tribe leader, when you listen to your audience, because everything in paradise, the creating of the podcast, the growing of the audience and the monetizing, all of the ideas for Podcasters Paradise came from my audience who are now the members of paradise and growing. All I can say is you're throwing some big numbers up there on the board and you know, <laughs> congratulations to you and, and good on you. Uh, Thanks. I wanted to ask, because I know you mentioned sometime last year, I believe it was, you actually met with some of the folks at, at iTunes and got a, got a little view on the inside of iTunes. And I wanted to cover some of the world of podcasting numbers with the audience, such as uh, how many podcasts are out there nowadays and, and, and where you see podcasting going in the near future. Yeah, so uh, I was honored to have been awarded Best of iTunes in 2013 for my podcast, Entrepreneur on Fire. And what was really cool about that was iTunes actually asked me to fly on up and meet with their team um, in Cupertino, right south of San Francisco, where the Apple headquarters is. So it was a really cool process to kind of get in there and see you know, Steve Jobs' creation. Didn't get to see Steve Jobs, but his, mm -hmm. his creation, and sit down with the iTunes team and, you know, really kind of have them pick my brain, but also be able to pick their brain about where I saw the future of podcasting going and flip side, where they were looking to bring podcasting through the iTunes and, and Apple perspective as well. And, you know, I kind of got my early glimpse into the fact that they were going to be making the podcast app native on all iPhones, which just actually happened last week in the iOS 8 update. So now, whether you like it or not, if you have an iPhone, the podcast app is on it. And that's amazing for podcasters. Yeah. And then number two, um, they are rolling out Apple CarPlay right now. And into 2015, all cars rolling off the lot will have Apple CarPlay in their dash, which just is going to be a game changer and, and is sparking a lot of competition. So Android Auto through Google has come out and is doing the same thing. And Stitcher Dash is doing the same thing. So you're just seeing all these different ways now for people to listen to podcasts in their car, which is going to be such a game changer. So, you know, before there was some kind of barrier, now there's not. And, you know, you asked the number specifically about the numbers of podcasts. Well, there are over 200,000 podcasts out there, which sounds like a big number, and it kind of is. But when you compare it to other mediums like you know, the ridiculous number of, of YouTube videos that there are and channels and, and blogs that go live every single day. Um, you know, it's still, a, it's actually a very small number out there. And when you even go a little bit deeper, just because of the nature of podcasting, only 
10% of podcasts that are ever launched make it past episode seven. So if you literally get to episode eight, you can pat yourself on the back and successfully say, I am a top 10% podcaster. And so the amount of actual live and currently in production podcasts that there are out there is a very low number and an incredibly low number when you compare it to other forms of media. Like uh, radio stations, aren't there something like over 6 million radio stations in the U.S.? Yeah, and there's something like 300 a day are closing. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Well, that's, I guess that doesn't come as a big surprise. So Not at all. So now that you've become a successful entrepreneur, could you ever, could you ever imagine going back and, and working for corporate America or being stuck in the cube farm? You know, it'd be really, really tough for me to do so. And I'm actually reading a really good book right now that I would recommend anybody that has become a successful entrepreneur to read. And it's called How I Lost a Million Dollars. And what's really, <laughs> and this was actually back when a million dollars actually meant a lot. You know, it was like in 1970, this guy made a million dollars and then lost it. And the, he made it over the course of like 10 years and lost it in the course of two and a half months. And he goes through his whole story about that process. And it is really an eye opener because, you know, the biggest problem that entrepreneurs face, successful entrepreneurs face, is thinking that your crap doesn't stink. You know, it's actually thinking that you, the individual, have a lot to do with your success when the reality is timing, luck, and so many other factors have so much to do with your success. And if you, as an entrepreneur, no matter how successful you are, can stay humble and can really realize that, hey, I need to just continue to realize that a ton of luck and a ton of great timing and a ton of other factors is a huge contributing factor to my success. Like, sure, I worked hard. You know, sure, I've, I have a couple of skills that help out. But the reality is, a lot of other things went into that. And if you can just keep that mindset that, hey, all it takes is one bad roll of the die and I could be back at ground zero. And this is what happens to that guy. You know, he was literally on cloud nine and he was making, you know, incredible amounts of money every single day, just gobs and gobs of it. And then all of a sudden it was just all taken away from him that easily. And then he profiles so many other entrepreneurs who have gone through that exact same thing. And I never even knew this, Joe, but, uh, he goes into uh, a little detail about Henry Ford, about how for the first 15 years, he built an amazing empire. But what so many people don't talk about is that the 20 years following those first 15 years completely blew up the Ford machine. They never had a profitable year after the first 15 years for the, for the rest of basically Ford's life. But for definitely the next 20 years, it was all downhill. All because he wasn't able to, to realize that he could be wrong because he had been right for so long. He was blind to the fact that he could be wrong. So it's really fascinating. And it really just kind of is, is teaching me a good lesson right now to continue to stay humble and to continue to stay hungry and really focus on just, you know, delivering value to my team and to my listeners, Fire Nation, and to keep my eye on the ball. I'll have to get that book. Yeah, it sounds fascinating. So Veteran on the Move is a podcast leading and guiding veterans to entrepreneurship. And so I'd really like to ask you, if you're speaking to that veteran out there or anybody in the veteran community that's listening, what kind of advice would you have for them before they begin their transition into the world of entrepreneurship? Well, number one, I would say keep listening to every podcast that you're listening to on a veteran on the move. Number two, <laughs> <laughs> double subscribe to uh, High Speed Low Drag, which is my podcast where we talk to successful and inspiring veterans who have successfully transitioned from the military world to the civilian world. Mm -hmm. Joe, have we had you on that podcast yet? No, I've uh, um, I've had Antonio on this podcast and I've, I've listened to their first uh, few episodes and heard you guys on there. And uh, Okay, I'm going to send you a sign up link as soon as we're done here. All right. I got to get you on. Sounds great. And also, you know, find that mentor, find that mastermind, you know, think about what, who, you know, where you want to be in this world and then find people who are at that place in that area that are rocking and rolling because every industry, every niche, every thing has their rock stars and find those rock stars and reach out to them 
be bold. Fortune favors the bold and just ask that question. Will you mentor me? Can I invest in myself and be mentored by you? And really, you know, be willing to invest in yourself. You did it, Joe, with me and, you know, and many other people. I, I did it before, um, you know, before with Jamie Tardy. I mean, it's, we are all standing on the shoulders of giants and, it, and you need to be willing to invest in yourself to make that happen. And, you know, like right now when people reach out to me, Joe, I don't even know if you know this, but I no longer do one-on-one mentoring. You were one of my last mentees because I now have to focus my time and energy in more scalable and leverageable areas. You know, now that Entrepreneur Fire has become so successful and so such a revenue generating machine. So, you know, I, now when I get these recommendations or when I get these um, requests from people to, to mentor them, I do have a network of people that I recommend that they get um, mentored by. So even if your person you reach out to says no, you can you can still have a hope that they will direct you to somebody that will um, be that perfect mentor for you because that's the first step. You need to be willing to be an apprentice and learn from people who have been there and done that and who have made the mistakes that you can avoid because if you don't avoid those mistakes, you're wasting your most valuable resource, which is time. And then number two, and that's, you know, join your mastermind, find that group of people that are in a similar place to the, as you are, but make sure that they're inspiring and successful in what they're doing now and surround yourself with them so you can continue to engage with the right people, be supported by the right people, support the right people and build the right relationships as you drive forward in your entrepreneurship journey. Right, John, I know we're getting close to the end and that, that was some great advice. I'll, I'll give you the last word and uh, I don't, I'm not sure if you can top uh, w- what you just did, but uh, I will give you the last word. Uh, and before I do, I'd just like to thank you for being here and, uh, and share, sharing your words of wisdom and, and your experiences with us. Well, thank you, Joe. It's an honor to speak to veterans, to speak to a veteran. And, you know, I really believe that we are the backbone of the future going forward. And there's been a lot of people like Antonio, like Tom, like yourself, like me who are proving it. So it's an exciting future. All right. John Lee Dumas, once again, thanks for being here. And uh, we'll catch you on the flip side. Catch you on the flip side, Joe. Thank you for listening to Veteran on the Move, your pathfinder to freedom. If you like the show, leave us a review on iTunes. Reviews are always greatly appreciated. So until next time, this veteran is Oscar Mike.